love got to do, got to do with it. <laughs> I, uh, I so was so tempted this morning at the nine o'clock service to do that, but I knew I could not. <laughs> so I saved it for you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Lord, as we jump into this fifth week in our series on binge reading our Bibles, help us to take time needed to press the pause button on all the outside influences in our lives long enough to allow your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and minds and show us how to apply your word to our everyday living so that we in return can learn to love just like you. And Lord, I ask that you would be so gracious as to let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. For God, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. It's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. In the year of 1984, when a woman by the name of Tina Turner at the age of 44 became the oldest female artist in the history to ever record a number one hit. And no, she's not my cousin. It is said that the song titled, What Love Got to Do With It, is Tina Turner's biggest song ever. Over 20 million copies of this song were sold within two weeks of its release date. The song tells the story of a love relationship between two people that was built solely on erotic love. Erotic love was derived from the Greek word eros, which is a love built upon a physical attraction mixed with great passion. It's the kind of love that makes you feel wonderful in the moment, but leaves you feeling empty if that's the only love your relationship is built upon. Erotic love has been the culprit of countless adulterous affairs in and out of the body of Christ. Erotic love is the culprit of dysfunction in so many families, low self-esteem, and all manners of mental health disorders. And if you had the opportunity to talk to those who have fallen prey to the lure of Eros love alone, you will quickly discover that erotic love alone will always leave you feeling lonely, unfulfilled, unsatisfied, and yes, it will leave you feeling empty. You may even know, you may be married, but you're feeling empty. You may be single and say that you're satisfied, but you're feeling empty. You've got the biggest house and you have the greatest job, yet you're feeling empty empty. You may even know how to recite the Apostles' Creed without looking at the screen behind me, and you may be able to sing the doxology, but somehow when you lay your head on your down pillow at night, you find yourself asking the question that over 20 million people that bought that song in the year of 1984. You may be asking yourself when nobody knows, what's love got to do with it? 
And my response would be that love's got everything to do with it. For it was the love, it was love that caused Jesus to hang on a tree. And it was love that led Jesus to suffer and die for you and for me. So with God being my help, I'd like to share with you the immeasurable, boundless, eternal, unfathomable love of God as we explore the Gospels of Jesus. For this love has nothing to do with a feeling. And I know we're hooked on a feeling. But this love has nothing to do with a feeling. And there's absolutely nothing we can do to earn it. For this love swings on the character of the greatest lover of all times. The Gospels. Four portraits. One, Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament are known as the Gospels. They're known as the Gospels because they tell the good news of Jesus. Each book showcases the progression of Jesus' life, relationships, and ministry while on earth, up to his death, burial, and his resurrection. The Gospels serve as a bridge between the Old Testament theology and the New Testament teaching. This is a sidebar, because you know I always have a sidebar, so I'll reel, somebody will reel me back in in a few seconds, but the bridge is kind of like the body of Christ. Like we should be. We should be the bridge between race, relations, and we should be the bridge between denominations. We should be the bridge between cultures. We should be the bridge between economic status. And I know this is going to be a shocker for some of you, but we, the body of Christ, should be the bridge between political parties. The first three books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are often referred to as the synoptic gospels, for they are written with a very similar viewpoint. While John's gospel defers in prominence, every time I think about John, I think about me because I'm just a, a wild card, but... <laughs> While John's gospel defers in prominence because John's gospel have a more of a theological tone. John's gospel seem to be concerned with the meaning of Jesus' words, his works, and his identity. You can clearly see that this, as, as the very first words, if you have your Bibles and you flip to John 1, 1, really, really, really quick. You will see the very first words in the book of John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. John was confident in who Jesus is and he was confident in the agape love that Jesus had for him. John was so confident in the unconditional love of God that he is the only disciple recorded as calling himself the, the disciple whom Jesus loves. And in the nine o'clock service, I shared with them that I would like to go to our vision team meeting on, on Tuesday morning. And when I arrive, I walk in and talk to them and say, but I, Reese." The disciple that Jesus loves has arrived. <laughs> and I'd like to think that I could share with you what they would say about me, but I don't think it would be appropriate. <laughs> so, you see, it has been reported that if there were only one verse to sum up the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, that one verse 
That one verse could be found in the book of John. Martin Luther referred to this verse as the heart of the Bible. He also said it's the gospel in miniature. And all around the world, this one particular verse is known as the gospel in a nutshell. And you know I'm a big girl, so I'm thinking that nutshell has to have a lot of meat in it. It can be found in John 3.16. I would dare to say that most of you know this by heart without even opening up your Bibles. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I'm a firm believer that one, that one verse proves that love has everything to do with it. Wherever you find yourself this morning, that one verse proves that ev God has everything to do with it because God is love. So in closing, I'd like to put to rest every ism and every schism, every doubt, every fear, every worry for the answer to to every issue in life can be found in this one verse. So if you'll give me just a couple seconds more, I'd like to dissect this. If you have a pen and pencil, now's the time to pull it out because I'm going to go through each word for word. For God, that's the greatest lover. It responds to atheism. For the Bible declares that God is a spirit and they that worship him must Worship him in spirit and in truth. He so loved that to the greatest degree, and that responds to fatalism. For the Bible declares that he spoke, and whatever he spoke, it came into existence. The world, he's the greatest company that you could ever have, and that responds to nationalism. For the Bible declares that there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That he gave, that was the greatest act and it responds to materialism. I know we like our things. We like our houses. We like our car cars. We like our electronics. We like our clothes and our shoes. But that he gave, that was the greatest act. It was an act so great that money could not buy that. His only begotten son. Jesus is the greatest gift that we will ever receive. And that responds to Islam. For Jesus himself declares that God is the way, the truth and the light, and no man can come to the Father except through him. No man, stick to my notes. <sighs> so that whosoever, <laughs> This is the greatest invitation of all times. And it responds to racism. And though it may surprise some, I'd like for us all in this place to acknowledge that Jesus died, and I'm a living witness, and was buried, and was crucified, and rose on the third day, not just for one person, but whosoever. That means the black man, that means the white man, that means the Asian man, that means the Hispanic man. It's all inclusive. Wherever you are, whoever you are, Jesus died. But it didn't stop there. He loved us so much that on the third day he got up with all power in his capable hand. Believeth. That's the greatest simplicity. And that responds to every doubt, every insecurity, every fear, 
in every lie that the enemy has told you. Every lie that the enemy has told me. Every lie that someone's told you that you have to work a little bit harder or you have to do a little bit more, you have to spend a little more time in prayer, you have to spend a little more time in your Bible, that's great and we need to do that. But God says we just need to believe. It's just that simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the word of God, not my words. So in case no one's told you in a while, it's all about believing in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In him, he is the greatest person that ever existed. He's not a thing. He is a person. And from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. That responds to our self-sufficiency. For it's all about the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Should not perish. That is the greatest promise we'll ever receive. And it responds to annihilation which said that when it's over, it's over. There's nothing after this life, but that's contrary to what the word of God says. I don't know about you, but death is not the end of my story. For the word of God says to be absent from this body is to be in the presence of God. So I know, no matter what annihilation says, that I'm going to live and reign with Jesus forever and ever. And then we have this word, but that is the greatest difference. It's a conjunction that has the ability to change all the rules of the game. Everything else that was said before the word, but is contingent upon this. It's like, but then you hear the word, but you know what? All that happened, but God has the ability to change the game, no matter where you find yourself. He has the ability to change the game of your health. He has the ability to change the game of your love relationship. He has the, the ability to change the game without informing you or finding out if you approve. He can change the game of whatever your situation is. As a matter of fact, the biggest game changer was when they hung him high and stretched him wide and they crucified him. And for me and you, he died. But then on the third day, that was a game changer. And if I don't stick to my notes, I might be six hours. So I'm going back to my paper. <laughs> have. When you see the word have in the scripture, that's the greatest certainty. And that speaks to every ounce of uncertainty that we face in our private lives, the stuff that nobody knows that's going on with us, the struggles we have in our own mind with our saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost self. That, that's the greatest uncertainty, and, I mean, certainty, and it speaks to uncertainty. For it's only in Christ that we live and we move and we breathe and we have our being. And every single day I get up, I tell the Lord, I can't do anything without you. Absolutely nothing. And I am nothing without you. But then I tell him, but with you, God, I know I can do all things because you give me my strength. Everlasting life. And that is the greatest possession this puts to rest all the what ifs. For the Bible declares that Christ Jesus died, that we may live forever. So the answer to the question, what love got to do with it? Love has everything to do with everything. For it was love that caused God, the God of the universe, with all his sovereignty, to look down from heaven and see our fallen nature. He saw all mankind. He saw you when he saw me. He saw our children and our children's children. He saw the children that we'll never be able to see. And he knew that we needed a savior. 
he saw our best works. And he knew that even at our best, it was as filthy rags in the sight of Jesus. He saw our worst and knew that he had to find a way because his compassion drew, drew him to love on us. And it was his love that caused him to take a piece of himself, the sovereign God, and wrap himself in human flesh to be born of a virgin. It was love that caused him to suffer under Pontius Pilate. It was love that kept him there to be crucified. It was his love for you and his love for me that caused him to die and be buried. It was that love that caused, the God, that caused God the Son to descend into hell. But as he saw your sin and my sin, he saw your face and my face. He saw the ones that we hate because of the things that we think are unforgivable. He saw the adulterer. He saw the murderer. He saw the child molester. And as much as we would like to see something happen to them, his love made him complete the job. He got up on the third day with all power in his hand and ascended into heaven. And right now, he's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and interceding for me. The good news is that one day, He's coming back to judge the living and the dead. And so when someone asks you, what does love have to do with it? I dare to tell you that love has everything to do with everything. For the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4 16, and so we know and rely on the love of God, on the love of God has for us. And then it says this, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Amen.